Good morning. I wanted to share um, an interview with you that I did uh, with uh, the author of Flotsometrics, uh, Curtis Ebbesmeyer. Um, you, I know you're familiar with the book. It's a wonderful book and you need to go buy it if, if you haven't read it yet. But um, Ebbesmeyer is an oceanographer, but he uh, is much more than that. He, he has a wonderful philosophy about uh, his, his career and job and about science and 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 how uh, people like yourself and myself, students of of uh, oceans and beaches and and coastal zones, uh, can pursue their passion. How they should go about doing that. Um, and in this interview, I think uh, probably that is uh, the most interesting information. You'll find that I'm asking him questions to which I know the answer, but I just want him to. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Uh, he's a good storyteller and so I ask him about his time working in for the oil industry and so on and and I I think you will find the interview interesting but but also to some extent sort of useful for how you and I can think about our professional life about uh, relationships uh, that we have and and what really matters so um, thank you uh, Corinthian Yacht Club uh, at Chill Shoal Marina in, in Seattle, Washington for letting us film uh, the interview in your facility. And thank you, Curtis, for uh, coming, coming down and, uh, and visiting with us for a while. So enjoy. And didn't you start in the oil industry? I mean, you, you were an engineer originally and... But I went into oceanography. But they, right. But they, you, I was Mobile's first oceanographer and they yeah. hired me. Not too long after the Santa Barbara oil spill. Well, I found that very interesting. So you kind of cut your teeth in the oil industry, and then you how know, did you get interested then in moving on? You, you got an oceanography degree because I think it was uh, well, one of the American oil companies paid for part of your graduate mobile. school. Mobile did, yeah. And I had been a roughneck at Bakersfield. Yeah. So I knew, the, I knew the patch. I knew the oil patch, but I couldn't stick around. Uh, Vietnam was playing all kinds of games with deferments. Yes. If I had a choice, I could basically go to Vietnam or go to graduate school. So I right. went into oceanography. Yes. And so along comes Santa Barbara oil spill. And um, there wasn't but one, ocean, one oceanographer in the whole country that had oil patch experience and an oceanography degree. And that was you, yeah. Yeah. And nobody likes to admit it, but the University of Washington was founded by, the, uh, the Ocean Department was founded by John D. Rockefeller. Huh. He gave the million dollars yeah. to build the Ocean Department. Mm -hmm. There's no sign or anything. He, he was very retired <laughs> yeah. about his giving. Yeah. And um, so I went to work for John D. Rockefeller's <laughs> company. It was called Sacconi Mobile, Standard that, that, Oil New York, and that's that, right. was, that was his yeah. his mother company. Well, sometimes oil money is used for good things, I guess. Tell me the yeah. comment that you made um, in your book that oil executives in the days when you were working all had to be roughnecks. They all had to go out and sort of see what it was like down on the ground, and that that isn't true anymore. You had to do the roughneck work for yeah. six months before they even let you in the office. You think that would have been a good idea nowadays to educate some of the executives in the oil industry? I think it would be a fine idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe in that. I, I, I'm, mother a Mobile used to be called Mother Mobile. <laughs> yeah. And they, when you went to work for Mobile, you had a job for life. Yeah. And if you left, which I did, mm -hmm. they were not too pleased with that. Yeah, yeah. Things have changed, of course, now, but they really had this um, this attitude that right. the company would take care of you. And so I, I worked as a roughneck for six months. You, know, you get dirty. You get covered with oil. Yeah. You got to pull the pipes out of the ground. You got to do all that dirty work before you can even begin your engineering and training. Yeah. Yeah. So I was very fortunate. Well, yeah, it, it's hands-on experience is always wonderful. How did you um, get the first moment when you decided that you were interested in um, debris and flotsam, let's call it? Um, how did that happen? I think 
my life has never been planned. Yeah, yeah. It just seems to flow. <laughs> but the the big things that happen are pretty much unplanned. Mm -hmm. I met my wife by accident. I, yeah. I found oceanography by accident because I yeah. happened to be doing scuba diving. Hmm. I found the oil industry by accident because I answered a, a flyer on a bulletin board. <laughs> uh, out of no, I never had a father who said, I'm a lawyer, you be a lawyer. I'm a doctor, you be a doctor. It was always, we're just all farmers and we just always had to kind of scratch around for something to do. Yeah. And you had a moment when you discovered flotsam and tides. Well, that was pretty much uh, my mother's doing. Is that right? She, um, see, when my mom, my father got cancer, of, he was a traveling salesman. He'd always have his elbow out the door, window Ooh. in Southern California. He got melanoma, almost died. Oh. So it's, at age 62, he was forced to retire, and they moved up here. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dad and Mom, if you move within a couple of blocks, we can do a lot of things together. So yeah. They took out a compass and drew a, a circle around <laughs> our house, and we got there. So for 20 years, I'd have lunch up there like four times a week. That's wonderful. And my mother would pull out a newspaper, and she, she always would like to be my clipping service. She says, mm -hmm. well, what's this, what's this, and what's that? <laughs> and one day she said, what about all these shoes? Oh, yeah. What are all these Nike shoes washing up? And I said, well, I'll look into it, Mom. I, I made a few <laughs> phone calls, and I said, you know what, the, each one of those is a message in a bottle. Mm -hmm. It cost $5 back then to put out one message in a bottle in the ocean for scientific purposes. Yeah. 80000 was big money. Yeah. At one time, one location, I said, this is a scientific bonanza, and I just went with it. So you saw science in sneakers. Yeah. I, yeah. Just, I, I just looked at them as drifting objects. I knew where they started, and I knew where they fanned out, and I knew just tracking things, that's what I was doing all the time, yeah. oil or sewage or whatever. I said, this is, this is, this is a big opportunity here, so I just, I went with it. Yeah. And then I discovered the container industry was losing 10,000 containers a year, and two more years we had the toy spill, and then two more years we had the hockey glove spill, and it just, it just keeps on going. Yeah, yeah. The, did you also sort of first discover some of the tidal currents and, 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 and other movements of the ocean by tracking the ducks and other things that others had kind of missed? Yeah, the, um, it's really interesting. The, one of the Bibles of oceanography when I was in school called The Oceans yeah. never talks about the gyres. It's not even in the back of the index. Yeah. But they're the big gyres that go between the continents. Right. And they weren't even mentioned, but then I saw the ducks were going right around the gyre up in Alaska, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it turned out to have a period of three years, which was exactly what the temperatures and salinities have been saying. So I wrote a paper with some friends of mine that we took five different data sets, all of them showed three years, and I said, wow, orbital period, three years. Yeah. And then I started doing it for all the other gyres, and I noticed that they were in a harmonic progression three years, six years, um, 13, actually 1.7, 3.3, 6 point something, and 13. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is an accident, but I didn't say anything about it for 10 years because I wanted to prove it prove statistically, it. Yeah. which I did. Yeah. And that's what's in this book. That's what in Flotsymmetrics, exactly. Yeah. And so that's 40% of the planet yeah. that was not being thought about. And then I, did, I also <laughs> yeah. discovered the garbage patches. Yeah. I sort of wrote about those. So I began to see that the planet is virtually unexplored. <laughs> well, it's very interesting, too, because you basically had a gigantic lab experiment that would be impossible to do these things in a, in a lab, but it was the whole ocean was your lab. Yeah, it still is. Because you were able to do very similar, very precise work yes. on that larger scale. If you have, you know, the statistics of large numbers, yeah. if you have a very bad thermometer, right. if it's accurate but it's not very precise, yeah. if you make a million measurements, you'll get a very precise answer. Yeah. And that's all that drifters are. If you have many, many, many thousands, you'll wind up getting a very precise picture of the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Do you um, have sort of 
you said you haven't really done things with a plan, so you're continuing now to do a lot of stuff uh, with um, beachcombers, for example. Um, tell us about that a little bit. I think you, you have a, a big festival somewhere in Washington State that you... Well, there's about, uh, there's about four beachcomber fairs that I go to every year. Four of them, yeah. Two in Washington. Yeah. And they were going on long before right. I showed up. Right. One in Sitka, which I helped, which I founded. Yeah. And one in Cocoa Beach, which I helped Kathy Katz find uh -huh. get going in '96. So. And what happens at these events? You see this table here; it's sort of empty. Yeah. <laughs> so I start out with an empty table on uh, Friday morning. Mm -hmm. By Friday noon. It's full of stuff. The people just, what's this? What's this? They said, you can have that. Just, and we, uh, many of it, much of it I know what it is. Yeah. But there's also amazing discoveries mm -hmm. that people just dump on the table. And by the end of the festival, Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, it's just piled with stuff. And mm -hmm. then I, I write up the most interesting stories in the newsletter. In the newsletter, yeah. Like Rocket Club this last year. I couldn't believe it when Margie Mitchell, she cleans mm -hmm. the beaches down there and she says, here, what's this? I said, what is that, Margie? She says, I think it's a rocket plug. <laughs> and so I put it on the table. And it's, you know, it's, it's big. Huge, yes. It's huge. It <laughs> weighs, must weigh 100 pounds. I said, she says, I think it's a rocket plug out of the, the Delta II launches. They're putting up the new GPS mm -hmm. satellites now. And I said, oh, I don't know too much about this. Before I knew it, there was like two or three people that Worked for NASA just <laughs> up the street at um, Cape Canaveral. Yeah. I know exactly what that is. Let me see those numbers on that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, those are the rocket plugs. <laughs> There's eight of them on each Delta II rocket that goes up. they got to blow them out before they ignite those rockets because there's the main, yeah. the big main engine gets it up maybe 100 miles. But mm -hmm. then the second stage, there's eight of those outer rockets. But you have to keep them plugged so all the debris doesn't get in, up yeah. in there. So they just that's that wire that hangs out. You mm -hmm. just push a button and go boom. And so eight of these guys just come from 100 miles up and they're... <laughs> all over the beaches or marshes or wherever they happen they to land. Yeah. Yeah. Much of the time they go out in the Gulf Stream Do they? and they just yeah. go away. But this particular yeah. launch, yeah. August last year, the winds were on shore and mm -hmm. brought them all back. Threw them back. So it was the first time... Yeah that we had hmm. everything lined up and we actually could figure out those rocket parts. It's very, it's interesting. Pretty interesting. So that was a new discovery. How many people show up for these events? Uh, usually, uh, let's see, Grayland is a smaller one, 500. Hmm. Uh, it's a lot of people, 500. Uh, then uh, Cocoa Beach, a couple thousand. Hmm. Um, in the evening, the keynote speaker will draw a crowd of 150. Mm -hmm. Uh, at Sitka, Alaska, you may be only a hundred, and um, at Ocean Shores, right out here, it would be a couple thousand. Mm -hmm. So it ranges from a yeah. hundred, two hundred, up to a couple thousand. But yeah. it's not so much how many people. No, it's, that's it's right. Who brings in some really interesting stuff? Yeah. People who have a passion for this, and do yeah. they do this all year long? Then I mean, they go on weekends, or or the do they only do. go for these? No, the people events. go out all the time. All the time. All yeah. the time. Yeah. And they're always finding stuff. Yeah. And they know that when I show up, I'm gathering material <laughs> for the newsletter, <laughs> and then we sit down and we yeah. take pictures, and and those yeah. four festivals are enough to have stories oh, yeah. for the four issues. So that's kind of what it's about. I print 800 a quarter, and there's about 400 subscribers. Wow. One of my students, when she found out that we were going to do this class, asked if you were going to do another book, if you were working on something else like that. And I guess I've been invited to do two more books. Yeah. But I'm not sure that I can actually do them. Mm -hmm. Not for health reasons, but yeah. I'm not. I have to be convinced that I can actually tell the story. Mm -hmm. in an engaging way, but also where there's something to be learned. Yeah, so you want some sci some additional science or different science as well, or I just want, general learning about... I want to I bring out the science in a way that 
threads through my life, mm -hmm. so I can talk about it in a personal way. Yeah. But I also want to thread it through for a, a big picture. Like there's mm -hmm. some big pictures in this yeah. book. Yeah. You know, gyres and garbage patches. And yeah. So I'm, I'm searching for some of those big pictures. So I'm working on a couple of books, but it's yeah. Um, I have to actually write them before. I see what they're all about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not one of these guys that can grind out a proposal and sure. actually follow the proposal. Yeah. yeah. So you need to be inspired to kind of put it all together. In I, a I actually have, I have millions of words written. Yeah. But they're like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. So this book takes some of them and makes a book. It takes, I don't know, you know, takes a bunch of pieces and makes a book. Mm -hmm. But the whole table is full of pieces and I yeah. need to pull out um, the pieces that go here. I just finished a story of uh, the Canadian Center for Architecture asked me to do a um, 7,000 words on how drifting coconuts have influenced humanity. Wow. Um, so yeah. I, I had to think about that for a few weeks and I, they said, we want an abstract. So I wrote a thousand word abstract. I said, you know, this might work. <laughs> <laughs> might work, might might work, I mean, and so mm -hmm. I started going through, and I actually found I actually had seven thousand words on mm -hmm. coconuts interwoven through my life. Wow. So I finished that, and then they're publishing a book mm -hmm. with that seafaring coconuts as a, a story, along with architectural stories. Interesting. And I'm not quite sure how they're going to put it all together, but mm -hmm. that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I f I found that. I'm beginning to apply flotsam metrics. Yeah. There's there's a number of other books that cut through all the material, and I'm trying to see if the books will actually work. Yeah. So it's an ex those are experiments. So they're just further adventures on building, kind of bringing things together into big pictures that are virtually unknown. Do you have sort of followers in other countries who are doing something similar to what you're doing but in other venues and in, in uh, there are uh, other venues um, there are there are the jewels of the ocean glass balls and there are people who write about glass balls yeah and there are people who collect glass sea glass mm -hmm. and there's lots of books on that yeah and there are people who collect sea beans, like yes. in Florida. And I saw that you lecture on that in, in Florida, yeah. And they're, and they're in here too. Yeah, so they are, right. So there, there are, I call those, those are venues. Yeah. Yeah. So when I go there to Florida, most everybody's talking about sea beans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, the, I'm just a trash guy. <laughs> I, I don't, see the, the turtle people, lots of books are about turtles, sea yeah. turtles. Um, they are such a big group that mm. they can overpower the sea bean group. Right. <laughs> and I don't want trash to overpower the group. So mm -hmm. I'll just sit there and but if, if people have a trashy story, I'll kind of <laughs> figure it out. You yeah. Know? But, so that's, yeah. I tag along with the other venues as much as I can. That's interesting. To see what, because whoever's collecting glass mm -hmm. or sea beans or glass balls picks up a lot of other stuff. Yeah. In the course of doing that, yeah, and that's what, and I, that's your stuff, yeah. And I don't care what it is; I just want to know what it's what it's telling us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, one of the, I lived in New York, went to Columbia University, and there was a big interest and concern about medical trash that was being dumped offshore. Is that something? Is there a whole community of people who sort of are interested in studying that? Or? Yeah, medical waste is very big. There's a fellow right down here, Neil Chisholm. Mm -hmm. He's on the Duwamish all the time, and he's been collecting uh, pick lighters and used hypodermic needles, and, mm. and he and I are always corresponding about this stuff. And I said, you know, when I'm on Florida, I pick, if, if I'm out for a day, I'll pick up maybe 50 hypodermic needles. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So what do, you, he said, what do you do with them? I said, well, I don't want to stick myself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So you're I just would, throwing them away. You no, know, I, what I do is I'll, I'll take a piece of wood and I'll yeah, stick jam the needle, it into it. jam it in there, and then I'll, yeah. I'll keep them in plastic bags yeah. and bring them back. Yeah. I don't want any little kid oh, yeah. uh, to do that. Dangerous stuff. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of dangerous stuff on the beach. <laughs> they don't tell us that in the brochures. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's like um, 
there's a lot of big lighters out there, and a lot of them are, uh, you know, a quarter full of lighter fluid. Yeah. Now, if that were a part of a terrorist plot, that would be an incendiary device. That's right. So, I, I, to me, that's they blow up. explosives. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I tell people about that, about hypodermic needles. Uh, there's a lot of ampules that have medical, mm. very comp, very concentrated yeah. material. Yeah. And people bring those up to me. Mm. So, I, I collect those. Yeah. I got 20 of them. And I'm, I'm trying to find a way to get them all analyzed, but it's very difficult. Is it really? No. When you talk about, yeah. like, NOAA has a hazardous waste mm. division, what it really means is oil. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, yeah. like right off yeah. the coast here, we have these aluminum canisters yeah. that look like water bottles. Mm. They're f they were full of a powder, aluminum phosphide. Mm. They would put it in the hold of the ship to kill rats, roaches, and yeah. stuff. So when the grain got wherever it's going, it's free of those critters, but it still has um, wow. this poison. But what's happening is these grain ships are somebody's tossing over the uh, aluminum aluminum water bottle type thing. Yeah. And people walk up to me and say, "Well, I found one of those water bottles. I used it for. Um, I was drinking out of it." I said, oh, God! So right now we one of our I turn them over to Department of Ecology and they've been on the hunt for quite a while. Mm -hmm. We think there's some ships coming out of the Columbia mm. and out of Vancouver mm. that are full of grain. Yeah. And, people, and they're the ones that are... Uh, I've yeah. got reports of hundreds of them from Alaska all the way down to mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. well, it, what we're talking about here in addition to just the fascinating science of it all is also that this is really a huge hazard. I mean, beach um, Trash can can really hurt quality of life in, in many places. Many, it's, in many cases, if you take it all together, it's a, a dire threat to the ocean because yes. the plastic is not biodegradable, right. and it's infecting the food chain now. So that probably everything you eat out of the ocean has some plastic in yeah. it. Every seabird you see flying around has got some plastic in its guts. Yeah. So. We're in, in the process of, we really have infected the whole ocean. It's, it's horrific. And we are not aggressively dealing with that in terms of policy, are we? No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's off the radar. Yeah. No, we're not. So my students who are interested in uh, coastal policy and coastal issues, coastal zone management, or some of them are in oceanography. What should they go into? What are some areas that you think are kind of important in the future for students, grad students, who are interested in these topics that we've been talking about? I would look at all the poisons on the beach. Hmm. Everything that's, is, a, is a threat. Hypodermic needles, uh, big lighters. Mm -hmm. Find a way to trace every piece of it back to who did it. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. Yeah. Like those aluminum phosphide canisters. Find the grain ships. Mm -hmm. It's good old-fashioned detective work, but it's just not being done. Yeah. Everything on the beach, I'm, I'm, you know, big lighters, uh, ampules. Mm -hmm. uh, where does find out where each one comes from? Because they can, are literally killers. And are going to, you think there are going to be jobs for students who have this expertise? I mean, are we going to become <coughs> concerned enough about it to really beef up our, our, our science and our regulatory structures? To uh, the regulatory structures will always stay far behind what needs to be done. Mm. I had to give it a, a talk to like 300 high school seniors. I said, I said, you all have to kind of reinvent yourself probably five times. I told my father how he had reinvented himself. I said, I've done five times, but I'm just getting started on this stuff. And I'm here to tell you there's lots of jobs, and there are going to be jobs in, for example, uh, so-called green energy. Mm -hmm. oil, we're at peak oil now. In another 20, 30 years, oil will be on the, de on the decline. Yeah may already be now. So what are you going to replace it with? We're going to need every possible source of energy 
around. So I see lots of jobs in those huge wind turbines. Mm -hmm. I see lots of jobs in geothermal. Um, enormous potential. Yeah. And we'll overcome the resistance that people have to having wind turbines off their million dollar beach properties and so on at some point. It's already been overcome. Yeah. They're building the Massachusetts yeah. and hundreds, yeah. hundreds of them. In Hawaii, um, I see on the bridge over there, there's I don't know, 20 or 30 going up. Yeah. Right down here in Grayland, little old cranberry farming town, there's four <laughs> of them going up mm -hmm. to finance yeah. a senior home. Yeah, interesting. So it's the resistance has already passed. Yeah. So the, the wind energy, if you had a learning curve, is kind of halfway up. Mm. It's, it's one of those yeah. that are really uh, coming into their own. Now, those things I see happening are tidal energy. There's so many mm -hmm. strong currents around here. Yeah. You could take a container, put a turbine in it, yeah. and have enough power for your home. Yeah. So there's enormous potential. Uh, solar panels are starting to really come into play. Uh, batteries are becoming very, 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 very uh, efficient. So it's just, and Obama just got just funded this breakthrough in battery power. Look at the Chevy Volt. Yeah, it's 100 plus miles per gallon. Things are <laughs> happening. Yeah. Things are happening. I mean, the, the the near bankruptcy for the for the auto industry was probably a good thing. Mm. It got them out of the SUVs and into the high mileage cars, and I think it's it's wonderful. So there's this tremendous number of jobs. Yeah, and we really made so many messes on the planet that we're going to need all kinds of people to clean it up. And the, the coastal areas are a place, a happening place for all these things because often there is better wind and often the tides, of course, as you said, and currents are wonderful opportunities Just for all this. Just look at the BP spill. Uh, BP put in $20 billion in our escrow account. There's got to be thousands of jobs there yeah. <laughs> for, for doing things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's happening. It's, uh, it's really, really happening. And I can't urge your students enough to get away from their computer. Go out and knock on doors. Just just go out. For example, if you see a wind turbine, go knock, go find the engineers. Right. Just get involved. Yeah. Don't don't email them. Yeah. Just go <laughs> knock on the doors. That's uh, that's how I've gotten along in life. That's how my dad got along in life and I think it's uh, to me it's a key. Yeah. If you see uh, beach, if you see sea turtles and the oil spill, now I would go down there and get involved. Just go down there and get it all. You volunteer a little bit, and before you know it, you'll be, you have a job. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's, I think, the key to all of it is just knock on doors and talk to people and find out what needs to do, and before you know it, you'll be doing it. But do something that you would like to do. You want to build wind turbines? Well, go build them. How about geothermal? Well, go do that. Terrific. I always tell kids travel. Yeah. Get out of Dodge and go travel. <laughs> <laughs> travel and talk to people. And before you know it, you will have a very interesting life. Yeah.